Well, uh, how y'all doing today? Uh, I appreciate you all being here. I know you're all really disappointed that you're missing the NBA playoffs right now. Uh, huge sacrifice. I'll try to make it worth your while. Um, my presentation, as you can see from the uh, slide over there, is um, entitled Nephi in the Promised Land. Reading 1 Nephi 18 through 2 Nephi 5 in a Mesoamerican context. When we think of Nephi, we have this tendency to think of the old world, Jerusalem and Arabia. And this is understandable because since, you know, most of his record covers the old world. It starts in Jerusalem, it covers their family's journey through Arabia, and we've had some really, really impressive uh, uh, evidences have come forth out of that setting, uh, corroborating Nephi's account in a lot of ways. Uh, however, this tendency also has a, um, an effect of obscuring uh, the fact that Nephi lived most of his life in the Promised Land. And by the time he sits down to write his small plates, he'd in fact been living in the New World uh, for uh, almost 20 years by then. Uh, he says he starts 30 years after his father had left Jerusalem. Um, now it's true that, uh, and we can actually uh, go to the next slide here. This is just Nephi's two different worlds here. Um, it's also true that he gives us very little details after he gets to the Promised Land. So it's worth maybe asking the question, just how much can actually be said about Nephi in the Promised Land? Um, the answer is actually quite a bit. Um, and in fact, most of what I'm going to say has already been said uh, by the likes of John Sorensen, Brant Gardner, Mark Wright, uh, Diane Wirth, who spoke earlier. Uh, we're going to be using some of her stuff. Um, a lot of it's already been said, but it's all over the place in a lot of different publications and things like that. And so uh, what I hope to do here is, uh, drawing on their brilliant work, uh, bring it all together and be able to create a picture for you of Nephi um, and his family as they uh, first arrive and try to settle here in the Promised Land and see what, um, see what the, uh, the archaeology and other things tell us and how well the pictures come together for uh, those two settings. And uh, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, of course, that starts uh, this. Don't take this slide too seriously. Uh, I don't know if that's really Lehi's route. Um, but I did want to give you a visual. This is what they did. They had to go from Oman all the way over to, um, to the New World. And that's a long journey. It's approximately 20,000 miles of ocean. Uh, so you can imagine, uh, most scholars estimate this is about uh, a two to three year trip. You've got them um, island hopping and things like that. Uh, they almost certainly would have made stops along the way. Um, but you can imagine after all of this, uh, two to three years confined on, on a boat, whatever size it was, um, someone aboard that ship caught sight, the, the first sight of the promised land. Um, and uh, it's, hard, it's probably hard to imagine the excitement, especially since Nephi gives us very little uh, indication of the excitement. All Nephi says is, <clears throat> after we sailed for the space of many days, we did arrive in the promised land. Okay, great. Uh, really exciting. Of course, anyone who's ever uh, had to start building a colony all by themselves, which is probably nobody in this room, but hey, I don't know. Uh, but if you've read any accounts of your pioneer ancestors, if you have them, or even just accounts of uh, Jamestown or uh, the Pilgrims, things like that, uh, anyone who, who's familiar with that knows that the, the work has really only just begun once they arrive on shore. Like it's the, the, that's probably part of why Nephi just doesn't really give us that much. He's like, yeah, it was exciting to get ashore, but wow, we had a lot of work to do, right? Um, just a lot to do. So um, based on extensive analysis of the text, internal geography, though, um, <clears throat> John Sorensen, and uh, I will maybe clarify, I'm going to more or less follow his uh, correlation for this part of the Book of Mormon anyway. Um, John Sorensen uh, places Lehi's Landing uh, <clears throat> on the southernmost portion of Guatemala's Pacific coast or adjacent El Salvador uh, as the most likely place that uh, Lehi's party landed. 
Uh, so in the 6th century BC, according to Sorensen, um, in his latest uh, 2013 Mormon's Codex, uh, this area was mostly depopulated and politically inconsequential. Um, of course, that doesn't really tell us a whole lot. Um, and it was not completely uninhabited, and that's something uh, important that we need to keep in mind. Uh, Brant Gardner, in his six-volume commentary that uh, Coford is uh, putting 20% off right now, um, <clears throat> fleshes out some of the details. Uh, based on the number of identified sites, all of which appear to be just villages or hamlets, along the Guatemalan coast from between uh, 750 and 500 B.C., uh, Gardner estimates that there, were a there was probably a scattered population of about 1,000 people residing in the area when Lehi landed. Um, so this picture actually fits pretty nicely uh, with a few, th a few clues we get from Lehi when he is speaking to his children um, just before he passes away. We're still in the same land. They're still in the land of first inheritance where they landed. Um, and Lehi gives us two clues in this, uh, in this portion, I believe. Um, the first thing he does is he promised his family uh, that this land should be kept as yet from the knowledge of other nations. Although speaking prophetically, it goes without saying, I think anyway, uh, that such a description should reflect the conditions of the territory he was familiar with at that time. Um, it, would, it wouldn't mean very much. Oh, that was not supposed to go forward yet. It wouldn't mean very much to promise them that uh, there won't be other nations there if there were, you know, already other nations right there. Um, so I think that we can take that as an indication uh, of, of reflecting the, the area at the time. And then the second thing he uh, says is in chapter 2, he tells his son Jacob, uh, he's teaching him about the Messiah, he's teaching him about the plan of salvation, and he makes this comment, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth. Now, I wanted to, like, let's just, I, just think for a minute, just imagine you're Jacob, who's probably like a deacon right now. He's like 12, 13, maybe 14 years old at the oldest. That's actually getting pretty far up there. I, I tend to think he's around 12. Um, and remember, he's born in the wilderness in Arabia. And uh, you guys saw, you know, the long ocean journey they go across. If the last time Jacob saw people was like when they were in the old world, and his dad's like, hey, you know, it's really important that you get this, get this message out to the inhabitants of the earth. Jacob's like, yeah, whatever, dad. <sighs> not going to happen. I'm not going back that way. But if there's people there and they have interacted with them and they have traded with them and they have formed relationships with them, now Jacob can say, oh, yeah, they, I do know these people and they don't know about the Messiah. Uh, so, um, really important clue there, I think, uh, when Lehi uh, is telling his brothers, uh, telling his son Jacob um, to, um, to let uh, the inhabitants of the earth know about the, the gospel. Um, and then also in uh, 2 Nephi 5, 6, Nephi mentions, uh, he lists off all the people in the group who are uh, going with him when he's leaving town, if you will. Um, and then he adds to that all those who would go with me. And all those who would go with me were those who, were, who believed in the warnings and revelations of God, wherefore they did hearken unto my words. Uh, so this strongly implies that not only were there other people there, um, that, uh, but that some of them were actually willing to follow Nephi. Um, and again, this is a picture that fits uh, well with the Pacific coast of Guatemala around that time. Uh, just uh, as a comparison here, you've got a mostly depopulated and politically inconsequential populations. Uh, Nephi, or Lehi says no other nations. Um, there's a roughly maybe a thousand people living in the area, villages and hamlets. There are some inhabitants of the earth, according to Lehi, uh, that uh, they needed to share the gospel with. Um, and uh, Brant Gardner makes the observation that uh, smaller hamlets... Uh, this is, again, from his commentary, would have fewer people and hence less social and political stratification and therefore less resistance to affiliating with these attractive strangers. And uh, Brandt even goes on to talk about how um, the newcomers, that is, uh, Lehi's family, uh, had just come from a more complex society um, and as such would have been willing to follow the incoming Israelites um, uh, because... 
they would have brought with them new ideas and new skills that were otherwise not available in the new world. And so you've got, uh, you've got this picture of, uh, like I said, depopulation, uh, not a lot of population, inconsequential politically, no other nations, some inhabitants, and some who uh, are willing to actually follow and, and unite themselves with, uh, with uh, the people, with Nephi and uh, their family. Uh, so that's, you know, pretty, uh, pretty converging picture there. Um, the next thing that Nephi talks about after they land, uh, very first thing he talks about, he tells us about three things, seeds, animals, and ore. Okay, and uh, anyone who's been familiar with the Book of Mormon for a long time, Book of Mormon scholarship, is probably aware um, <clears throat> that uh, seeds, animal, and ore, <clears throat> or metallurgy at least, are uh, three of the big uh, anachronistic uh, type of things that a lot of critics will go after in the Book of Mormon. Um, my goal today, however, is not to provide a comprehensive uh, explanation of anachronisms in the Book of Mormon. Um, such can be read elsewhere, has been done elsewhere. Um, but my purpose instead is to just try and read the text in context, um, and I just understand what might be happening uh, in these specific instances, not other places where horses or whatever are mentioned in the Book of Mormon. Um, and I think it's interesting because in certain ways, the text is actually conforming to what our historical expectations uh, might be and uh, historical realities. Uh, so, uh, to start off, we're going to kick off with seeds. Um, so first thing, Nephi tells us, and it came to pass that we did begin to till the earth and we began to plant seeds, yea, we did put all our seeds into the earth. Uh, which we had brought from the land of Jerusalem, and it came to pass that they did grow exceedingly, wherefore uh, we were blessed in abundance. Um, so, Gardner has pointed out that uh, Lehi and his family uh, behaved sensibly and practically, adding naturally uncertain about which new plants were edible and what game was available, the colonists would plant the seeds of their familiar food. Um, and though this is sensible, practical, and natural, uh, this behavior does raise a few questions. And the first question uh, is whether or not uh, seeds brought over from the ancient Near East could even survive the journey in the first place. Um, having been collected early on in their journey while they were still near Jerusalem, uh, the seeds would have needed to last about a decade or so. And according to archaeobotanist Terry B. Ball and Wilford M. Hess, while it depends on certain storage conditions, the seeds certainly could have remained viable and survived the journey uh, which took several years. Uh, wheat and barley, for instance, uh, have lo sufficient longevity, even under less than ideal storage conditions, to survive for more than a decade. Uh, so having viable seeds itself is not necessarily a problem. Uh, next question is whether they really could thrive um, in this new environment. I mean, this isn't the same place. This isn't Palestine anymore. Um, very different environment. So, speaking of the coastal zone where they would have settled, Sorensen says that the climate favored rapid crop growth, uh, which seems to be consistent with their success reported by Nephi. However, uh, since the more sedentary uh, part of the population, and uh, we learn in 2 Nephi 5 um, <clears throat> that uh, he, you know, he explains they go to another area, they start building buildings and things like that. Um, he talks about his brothers, and while some of this is uh, certainly pejorative and um, you know, there's, uh, there's some ethnic boundaries being made. If we can, uh, if we can take that uh, and just uh, the description of them as, as semi-nomadic hunters as relatively reliable, our indication is that the more sedentary part of the population uh, reportedly leaves the area, while those who remained are largely semi-nomadic hunters. Um, so that would maybe indicate that they did not have long-term agricultural success in that area, um, and this would be typical of imported crops. Sorensen explains the historical experience of other colonizing parties around the world shows that although reported species may grow well to begin with, they frequently do not do so in the long run. Uh, this long-term failure would also serve to explain the lack of evidence of old world crops. Um, you know, you wouldn't expect to find that, you know, someone who just planted some seeds once 2,600 years ago, you're not going to, you're not going to find those. Later, In fact, an example of this is uh, right in Mesoamerica comes from the 16th century Spanish report that millet, a grain brought over from the Old World, was growing marvelously well in the Yucatan Peninsula, yet botanists today cannot detect a trace, uh, any trace of the millet in the area. 
Um, so again, in this regard, Nephi's account seems to accurately capture the real life of Near Eastern settlers into this region. Planting their seeds in the coastal region, they experienced initial abundance as the area was conducive to rapid crop, crop growth. However, as is typical for pioneering groups, their imported crops eventually struggled to survive in the very different climate. And uh, this forces the agriculturalists uh, to migrate elsewhere while those who remained in the area uh, found other means of subsistence. And I should be, it should be clear, though, later on in the Book of Mormon, we do see uh, the Lamanites are also, uh, they've settled, they've built cities, they're, they're growing crops as well. But at this initial stage, at least, it seems there may be some truth to the idea that they're just largely um, hunter-gatherer. All right. So the next one. Uh, oh, there was another little comparison slide for you. Uh, the next one uh, is animals in the Book of Mormon. Um, Nephi talks about discovering beasts in the forest of every kind and in the promised land and lists off six different animals in pairs of similar types, none of which are commonly believed to have been native to the Americas. Uh, and then he adds that there was all manner of wild animals, suggesting, of course, that there were uh, other forms of wildlife as well. Um, historically, we know that historically when people encounter new environments with new wildlife, they are forced to find new ways to describe them. And this can be done by coming up with new words or by applying old labels to new items. Uh, when the latter happens, it's called loan shifting. And odd as it may seem, the process is well attested throughout history and, may, and many common names for both plants and animals are byproducts of such practices. Uh, for, examples, for example, the animals you probably know as robin, elk, and deer, um, or robin, elk, and buffalo, excuse me, were actually applied to the New World species here by the first European settlers. They were terms they had for species in the Old World that are, in fact, completely different. Um, and in, so the slide there shows you, actually, you know, on the one side you have the North American bison, which we commonly call the buffalo, um, and on the uh, other side you have the actual buffalo from Africa. Um, so, uh, so this is just what happens when people encounter new wildlife, they're unfamiliar with it, they don't have words for it, they borrow the words they already have. Um, Sorensen proposed that when Lehi's family arrived in the New World, um, they did as people in their situation have historically done, loan shifted common names of animals to the new unfamiliar species found in the Promised Land. After all, just what else was Nephi supposed to call some of these animals he'd never seen before? Um, so Sorensen suggests Lehites brought no animals with them, yet immediately after their arrival, they reported the presence of native fauna, native fauna, which they applied the names of their Near Eastern animals uh, that looked similar. Uh, Gardner similarly has pointed out, Nephites would have applied old world vocabulary in the new world artifacts, uh, including plants, animals, and weapons. Um, possible candidates from Mesoamerica that could have been intended by Nephi's label um, are just included on that table, and I'm not gonna read it off. Um, the information in that table, though, is derived uh, largely from just uh, cherry-picking stuff from Sorensen and also uh, Dr. Wade Miller, who wrote a book on the subject. Um, uh, and they're the ones who did the research to determine that these are different species that might have been in Mesoamerica uh, during Book of Mormon times and uh, might have been what uh, was indicated um, by those labels. Uh, it is important to uh, keep in mind, though, uh, these are just possibilities uh, and they certainly do not uh, exhaust all the possibilities that could be, uh, could be come up with here. Um, so although loan shifting is only one of multiple possibilities for explaining these anachronisms, it is a compelling one because it's exactly what people in Nephi's situation do. Uh, in almost, it almost certain, it's almost certain that some of the animals in the Book of Mormon uh, are, loan shift, uh, are, are using loan shifted terms. Um, and it's most likely that the loan shift would occur right here with uh, Nephi, Lehi, and their family. Uh, so what's typically seen as an obvious point against the authenticity of the Book of Mormon uh, can just as easily be read as a instance of uh, perfectly normal behavior uh, by a settling group of people. All right. So the next one we have, uh, he talks about finding all manner of ore. 
Um, and he says, we did find all manner of ore, both of gold and of silver and of copper. And it came to pass that the Lord commanded me, wherefore I did make plates of ore that I might engraven upon them the record of my people. Um, Gardner is actually the first one, at least uh, that I encountered, who pointed out uh, that there is a direct connection between finding ore and then creating the plates, um, which is generally obscured because we have a chapter division there, uh, but that chapter division is not original to the Book of Mormon. It was created in 19, er, 1879 when Orson Pratt uh, created the, what are now the modern chapter edition, uh, chapters, divisions of the Book of Mormon. Um, and it's also worth noting that the same three ores are identified in the land of Nephi in 2 Nephi 5 um, when he makes his second set of plates. So read together, um, it suggests that the plates were made of these three ores. Um, and a crucial often overlooked test is whether these ores are available in the right area to begin with. Uh, Gardner pointed out that while modern Guatemala does not have a major mining industry for these metals, they are present and sporadically mined. Um, and John Lund actually was uh, pointed out that uh, these three ores occur close together in a number of places uh, throughout Mesoamerica. Um, and Jerry Grover, who uh, you'll be hearing from later uh, on something completely different, but uh, he pointed out uh, in his most recent book on uh, Ziff, actually, that the wording here, both of gold and of silver and of copper, now that's weird wording because you say both for two things, not three. Um, but Grover has explained that native gold and silver nearly always occur together as one ore in nature. Uh, this is most, uh, and he suggests that this is the most consistent reading of the scriptural passage um, that gold and silver are a binary ore um, with the additional separate ore uh, being copper. So not only were there appropriate ores available, uh, but the text actually uh, accurately reflects the condition of their naturally occurring ores. And in fact, that picture you see there is uh, gold and silver ore kind of mixed together there in uh, some kind of rock. Um, difficult to extract the two separately there. Um, so there were ores um, that uh, the, the appropriate ores were there, um, but what about making metal plates with them? As it turns out, an alloy that was called Tumbaga by the Spanish, or Tumbaga, I don't really know how to pronounce it. I just make this stuff up while I'm standing here. Uh, was known in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica and uh, generally consisted of copper and gold and sometimes silver, because like we just talked about, they usually, they couldn't actually extract the silver from the gold most of the time. Um, the same three methods Nephi explicitly mentioned, or the same three metals, excuse me, that Nephi explicitly mentions finding before making his plates. Um, it was as early as the 1960s uh, that uh, Reed H. Putnam suggested that this alloy may be the material used to make the Book of Mormon plates. Tumbaga specifically refers to the alloy that has undergone depletion gilding, according to Grover. Uh, such gilding gives the Tumbaga a golden look, which is consistent with eyewitness descriptions of the plates. Um, Eyewitnesses who handled the plates estimated their weight as being approximately 40 to 60 pounds. Um, and for to, uh, Tumbaga plates of these same dimensions, Grover has estimated a weight range of between 53 and 58 pounds. And I should just maybe note right here that I have vastly uh, oversimplified Grover's actual studies in that regard. He ran a number of tests with a number of different scenarios um, to, to, uh, to get uh, those uh, various weights. Um, and he also determined, uh, and again, another vast oversimplification, get his book, read it, uh, that uh, the plates must have been approximately 90% copper, 8% gold, and 2% silver. Um, otherwise, they would have weighed too much. Um, thus, the plates were made of an alloy of copper and gold with a small amount of silver. Uh, so plates made of copper, gold, and a small amount of silver would have had uh, the proper appearance and weight per the eyewitness accounts. Um, so Nephi's account of a creating plates after finding gold, silver, and copper, um, and the eyewitness descriptions of the color and weight of those plates uh, are strikingly consistent with uh, available ores and metallurgical practices known in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. Uh, it should be noted, however, and here's a comparison slide for you, um, 
that uh, an important caveat to all of this is that the present evidence cannot establish metallurgical skills or Tumbaga artifacts uh, back into the 6th century BC. Uh, so we don't actually have evidence to put it in the right place at the right time uh, just yet, but it should also be pointed out uh, that Nephi probably learned to work with metals uh, in the old world, and it's not surprising that a lone man's craftsmanship uh, cannot be found by archaeology today. Um, though Nephi comes much earlier than the present evidence, uh, the way the remainder of the details uh, converge is nonetheless uh, noteworthy, at least in my opinion. Um, all right. Now, the next thing Nephi mentions in 2 Nephi 19 is a prophecy we already heard once um, from Lehi. Uh, he's reiterating, uh, Nephi's kind of describing the contents of the plates, and he reiterates the prophecy Lehi made that the Messiah cometh according to the words of, an of the angel in 600 years uh, from the time my father left Jerusalem. Uh, so that's what uh, the prophecy is, and that's again repeated in 2 Nephi 25, 19. Uh, the problem that we tend to have with that is the reign of King Zedekiah starts in 597 BC, as you can see there. And the birth of Christ is generally dated uh, between uh, 6 to 4 BC. And I know that sounds funny if you think about what BC means, uh, but yeah, Christ was actually born 6 to 4 years before Christ. Um, so that, if you do the math, only comes out to about or 591 to 593 years. Um, and some may be inclined to say, oh, Lehi or Nephi are just rounding off. Um, a full 600 years are reported as having passed uh, when the sign of Christ's birth is given. Um, so there have been another, a number of different solutions have been suggested uh, for this chronological question. Uh, and so this isn't the only one out there, but I do think it's interesting that there's a relatively uh, simple um, solution found in uh, what we know about Mesoamerican uh, calendar systems. Um, so in ancient Mesoamerica, uh, there were at least three different years uh, that were used. One is the 260-day sacred year. Uh, the other is the Hob, which is just a standard 365-day solar calendar. And the Tune, which is a 360-day year. And Sorensen explained that the Tune was used for most calendrical calendars. Uh, calendrical calculations, apparently serving as an approximation of the hob, having the special merit that it could be divided and multiplied more conveniently, uh, because 365, uh, 365 doesn't really divide by very much, um, but 360 is just a beautiful round number that you can do all kinds of things with. So long-term units were grouped into tunes like the ho-tune, which is five years, or five tunes, the ka-tune, which is four ho-tunes, 20 tunes, and the bok-tune, which is uh, 20 ka-tunes, 400 tunes. Although they fully understood the astronomical realities, uh, for convenience of long periods forward and backward in this time, a conscious compromise of convenience was made, uh, in the words of Sorensen. Uh, this compromise also conveniently accounts for 600 tunes between the years uh, in a little over 592 actual solar years. So if we mark off 600 tune years from Zedekiah's first year, Sorensen proposes, uh, 2,000 uh, 216,000 days brings us into the year overlapping 5 to 4 BC, an acceptable date for Christ's birth. Um, and I think it, I'm, there's a lot of other work that's been done on the chronology of the Book of Mormon, so this is certainly an open question. Um, but, and I'm not suggesting that uh, they marked their years regularly by the tune, uh, but what's interesting to me is that both the prophecy forward in time and the count back to Lehi's day in 3 Nephi 1 stretches over long periods of time in which the tune system was designed to more conveniently count. Um, also, of course, there's the issue that Lehi would not have used the tune system when prophesying uh, in the Arabian desert. Um, Nephi, however, may have adopted that means of counting long periods of time by the time he started making his record um, and hence used it to record the prophecy first made by Lehi. In other words, I'm suggesting that maybe Nephi takes a little literary license because he knows his audience will better understand the reference. Um, and because he himself has become somewhat enculturated over the last two decades. Um, so there's, there's that. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, 
there's other solutions, but I think it's just interesting that if we just put it in context uh, uh, within its culture, a, a relatively simple solution, in my opinion, presents itself. Um, so the next thing uh, that uh, comes up in 1 Nephi uh, 1 through 4, Lehi begins blessing his children. Um, and several scholars have commented on the fact that uh, Book of Mormon peoples are repeatedly divided into seven tribes. Uh, the structural division, tribal division, is first made clear in Jacob, uh, Nephi's brother, but appears to be drawn from uh, 2 Nephi 1 through 4, and was arguably Lehi who arranged them into seven tribes. Um, Jack Welch and a couple of other scholars uh, writing together wrote, One of the many enduring legacies of Lehi's last will and testament appears to be the organization of his descendants into seven tribes. After speaking to several of his sons collectively, Lehi spoke first to Zoram, second to Jacob, third to Joseph, fourth to the children of Laman, fifth to the children of Lemuel, sixth to the sons of Ishmael, and seventh to Nephi and Sam together. The seven groups, recon uh, the seven groups recognizable here are exactly the same as those listed in Jacob 1.3, fourth Nephi 1.38, and Mormon 1.8. Uh, this alignment into seven lineage groups requires that Sam be omitted or counted with Nephi, and the sons of Ishmael be lumped together rather than divided like each of the sons of Lehi is. Uh, therefore, it would seem that the, such a division was deliberate and thus the uh, seven was seen as a desirable number of founding lineages. It must be acknowledged that seven is significant in Hebrew numerology and appears to have been structured, uh, and appears to, uh, Nephi appears to have structured parts of his record uh, based around the significance of the number seven. Yet the notion of seven founding tribes or lineages appears to be a specifically Mesoamerican feature. Uh, Sorensen briefly noted this connection in 1985, uh, speaking of the sevenfold division uh, mentioned above. He wrote, these seven branches remind us of the fam famous seven caves or lineages from which traditions claim the inhabitants of Mesoamerica were supposed to have sprung. Uh, Diane Wirth, who spoke earlier today, um, has provided more extensive research on the topic. Uh, she had a paper in 2013 in BYU studies on the subject, um, and she explains, uh, a pan-Mesoamerican legend tells of a core uh, people descended from seven tribes, which may coincide with seven lineages mentioned several times in the Book of Mormon. The historicity of the seven lineages was equally important to tribal affiliations in Mesoamerica as they were to Book of Mormon peoples. Uh, now, I want to be clear that I'm not necessarily suggesting uh, that uh, there's a direct link between Lehi's seven lineages here, the seven Lehite lineages, um, and this uh, pan-Mesoamerican legend. Um, instead, I would propose that perhaps, um, and I'm not sure we have the evidence to trace this back as far as Lehi yet anyway, uh, but perhaps uh, there was already that tradition there in Mesoamerica, um, and thus Lehi, living within that cultural setting, or perhaps Nephi when he's writing the record and takes some literary license, um, uh, living within a cultural setting which seven was not only seen as an important and sacred number, but that specifically tracing a group's origins back to seven lineages was understood as essential. Uh, as such, Lehi or Nephi manipulated the number of actual lineages to form seven founding groups. In fact, Lehi may have done so in hopes that it would preserve the clan's unity after he passed since the ideal of seven tribes was only achieved when the sub-tribes of the Nephites and Lamanites were combined together. Um, so, now I have to warn you guys. Um, the next few things I'm going to talk about uh, are dependent on some specific chronologies uh, that, uh, that have recently uh, come into question in some recent Mesoamerican scholarship. And I, unfortunately, before I put this together last night, because we all know everyone prepares last minute, right? Um, I did not get an opportunity to actually take a look at some of the, uh, the more recent scholarship uh, on uh, the chronology that uh, makes, some vast, can, uh, makes some vast adjustments and shifts uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the chronology of Kamen al Huyu. Uh, so I don't know uh, what impact that has on what I'm about to say and whether, uh, whether or not anything I'm about to say is accurate or not. Just be aware. Um, uh, but, uh, just, yeah, we may have to, uh, some of this may have to be adjusted or revised. And, of course, uh, it goes without saying that also is true of everything I already said. Uh, scholarship is an ever-revolving uh, door of new ideas and old ideas being thrown 
out the trash, of course. Um, but with that said, let's move on. How are we doing on time anyway? Um, looks like we're doing pretty good. Uh, so the land and city of Nephi. Uh, when Nephi's group leaves the coastal area and seeks out a new land, uh, the only indication uh, where they went uh, is that it was considered wilderness and, uh, many day, and it took them many days to get there. Uh, using indications found throughout other parts of the Book of Mormon, Sorensen has proposed that the land of Nephi, which uh, they called their new settlement, was the Valley of Guatemala, and the city of Nephi was an archaeological site known as Kamenal Huyu. Um, Nephi reports that shortly after they arrived and settled there, uh, they began to prosper exceedingly, they began to develop the area with public building projects and the development of other skills. Um, and the exact date of these activities is uncertain, but, you know, I'd put it somewhere 580, 570 BC, something like that. Um, uh, so that's what's going on in the land of Nephi. Uh, so Kamenal Huyu, um, prior to this period, at least according to uh, uh, the older chronology, which I don't know if it is still valid or not, uh, the inhabitants of the Valley of Guatemala lived in scattered hamlets throughout the area and would have become a uh, metropolis of Kamenal Huyu, according to Sorensen. Uh, shortly thereafter, Sorensen reports that the archaeological remains uh, that... Uh, I must have mistyped this sentence, but in any case, around 500 BC, Kamenal Huyu rather quickly began to acquire urban dimensions. Um, Gardner uh, placed, uh, reported that Kamenal Huyu witnessed fluorescence beginning around 600 BC, but wisely urged its caution in attributing this directly to Nephi um, and the arrival of his small party in the already populated area. Um, I would rather suggest uh, that Nephi's description of expansion and urbanization is consistent with the broader developments seen in the archaeological record between 500 and 600 BC. Um, <clears throat> so, next thing that Nephi does, one of the building projects Nephi mentions is the building of a temple after the manner of the Temple of Solomon in terms of construction, uh, but not necessarily material. Um, Temples served an important legitimizing role for ancient states and rulers, and thus, this is exactly what a new ruler or leader would do. Uh, like um, trying to establish a new community uh, needs to establish legitimacy. Uh, so, yeah, he hasn't built a temple. Uh, some have questioned whether Israelites of Lehi's time would have felt it appropriate to build a temple away from Jerusalem. Uh, the Jewish community in Elephantine, established around 650 B.C., also built a Solomon-like temple, uh, suggesting it was not considered an inappropriate, uh, it was not considered inappropriate within that era. Uh, John W. Welch mentions Elephantine and several other examples. Inasmuch, um, quoting him here, inasmuch as Israelite temples were built at Tel Arad, Beersheba, Leontopolis, Elephantine, and probably elsewhere as well, Nephi's temple was not unique. While similar in several important respects, none of these Israelite temples were like Solomon's, however, in size or splendor. Uh, sounds very familiar to Nephi's admission that he couldn't build a temple ultimately like Solomon's because he just didn't have the resources. Um, the question still remains, though, how this might relate to the New World setting. Um, and I hope you aren't mistaking uh, this image here for my uh, version of what that might have looked like. This is just a, a cool image. Um, just a cool picture for you to look at while I say boring things. Uh, the question still remains. Uh, oh, I already read that part. So, um, in trying to understand what a temple after the manner or like unto that of Solomon's might look like, Sorensen points out an important limitation. Uh, surely he, meaning Nephi, a young non-priest when he lived in Jerusalem, knew little about architectural, conceptual, or constructional details of the first Iron Age. Um, oh, oh, we're done. Wait. There we go. Um, uh, anyway, uh, quoting from Sorensen, uh, the Nephi would have known very little about the actual construction of uh, the temple during the first temple period at Jerusalem, even though he had no doubt seen it often. What he brought with him was the idea of, or at least of a temple, 
and how it should look and function. Thus, after the manner of the Temple of Solomon leaves us to infer details loosely. Hence, Sorensen made comparisons to the construction of Mesoamerican temples in only broadest of terms. Uh, Gardner, meanwhile, uh, argues that uh, Mesoamerican temples were different um, were different from Solomon's in form, but served the same conceptual and symbolic purposes. Um, but both seem to agree that finding Nephi's original temple is impossible. Um, Mark Wright, uh, most recently, has proposed that um, it was the function of the temple uh, that was like unto the Temple of Solomon. And uh, Mark has uh, compared the functions of temples in the Book of Mormon to that of temples in pre-classic Mesoamerica. Uh, but in any case, Mesoamerica provides us a culture cultural backdrop where temples are important. Um, and uh, they have a lot of conceptual and uh, maybe functional uh, overlap between uh, what the Israelites would have been doing in uh, the Sol Solomon's temple. Um, so this area that fits geographically was also experiencing urban development around the same time Nephi describes such advances within his own community. And the idea of building a temple, a Solomon-like temple, would have had, uh, I mean, at least the idea of building a temple uh, would have likely had some kind of precedent uh, within that culture. Um, and uh, clearly, as we talked about, there's no problem with the Israelite refugees building temples, uh, as that's all over the place in the old world. Um, so Nephi's record, again, seems to fit uh, certain historical and cultural context uh, for the land of Nephi. Um, the last thing I'm going to just go over real quick is Nephi and kingship. Um, after Nephi taught his people productive skills, all of that jazz, building buildings, things like that, um, it says, and it came to pass that they would that I should be their king. But I, Nephi, was desirous that they should have no king. Nevertheless, I did uh, for them according to that which was in my power. Um, and although Nephi is kind of unwilling to be a king or take up that title, Jacob makes it apparent that he did at least fulfill the function of a king. He anoints a new king when he's uh, getting ready to uh, go. Um, and uh, so Gardner points out Nephi is one of the smaller number of people from the old world, and he indicates that he is opposed to kingship. Uh, this resistance suggests that the impetus to have a king is not coming from the old world Nephites, who would likely defer to Nephi's desires. Uh, thus, the pressure for a king seems to be coming from new world peoples who have uh, merged with uh, the Book of Mormon group. Um, and significantly, Gardner points out that the rise of monarchy in Mesoamerica occurred about this time. The social developments that typically lead to kingship began around 650 B.C. and reached fru fruition throughout the area by 400 B.C. The origins of ideographic and ideologic indications of kingship appear to come from the highland Guatemalas in and around the area of Kamenahuyu. Um, and that's again uh, with the caveat uh, that uh, this chronology may uh, no longer be accurate. But um, uh, for at least a time, scholars uh, were correlating that. Uh, though Nephi is a uh, little on the early side for that, social pressures and even the institution itself was likely implemented before the physical culture around it developed in ways that would manifest its existence. Gardner explains the ability of a king to mobilize the people to create monumental architecture may suggest that the governmental form preceded the architectural evidence for it. Thus, Gardner sees it as significant that the Book of Mormon people, uh, Book of Mormon places Nephi's kingship in the right location for nascent Mesoamerican forms of kingship albeit marginally earlier. Um, oh, and so there's just a summarizing uh, the material there uh, about Kamenahuyu. There's a comparison there. Um, and now we get to our conclusion. So, <clears throat> having read through 1 Nephi 18 through 2 Nephi 5, um, reading whatever little historical information that could be gleaned from the text in a Mesoamerican context, a uh, number of illuminating, illuminating details have come forward. Uh, while there are other ways to interpret some of the details in the passages discussed here, uh, the Mesoamerican lens, as seen today, consistently provides reading that resolves difficulties and sheds light. Uh, broadly speaking, the account of the Lehite's arrival, settlement, and expansion is consistent with historical realities and what limited data we have available for the proper time and place. Uh, the Lehites' actions are realistic for and expected from a small settlement group, and their decisions can be explained uh, within the broader events of their cultural backdrop. 
Uh, given the limited amount of data from both text and archaeology, uh, care must be taken not to get carried away with these comparisons, um, especially in light of the caveat already mentioned on the uh, chronology of Kamen Al-Huyu um, and other uh, important cautions that just come with, you know, scholarship and stuff. Uh, <clears throat> Though it is certainly true that none of the particular details uh, discussed here would have been impossible or outrageous for Joseph Smith to dream up, it must be confessed that none of the data here used to compare the text with Mesoamerica was available to Joseph Smith. Therefore, it is, uh, there is, of course, no limit to the speculations that can be made about what Joseph Smith uh, might have come up with, how Joseph Smith might have come up with this detail, or what source might have given him that idea, none of which can ever be tested or proven wrong. Um, I'll never be able to prove that Joseph Smith could not have dreamt up the settlement story in uh, 1 Nephi 18 through 2 uh, Nephi 5. Well, what I can do, however, is I can take the story he gave us and check to see how its details fare against the archaeological and cultural data. Does this story actually make sense based on what we know about this time, this place, and how people behave in similar situations? Uh, given what was presented earlier, just now, um, I submit that it does, um, and sometimes in ways that are quite remarkable and unexpected. Uh, what you make of such correlations is, of course, up to you, but for me, I find it difficult to believe that a story made up by a young New England farmer would so consistently fit the emerging picture of 6th century BC Mesoamerica. I prefer to think that the story was written by Nephi, son of Lehi, after migrating to the Americas and experiencing the events firsthand. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what do you know about the temple excavated on the outskirts of Guatemala City? I believe it was pictured in the lunchtime movie. Uh, we were told it dated to Nephite times. Um, I missed most of the documentary during uh, the lunch break, um, but uh, Kamenal Huyu is right in Guatemala City. I'm guessing that's uh, probably the temple that was shown and talked about. Yeah. Um, and other than knowing that it's at Kamen al I really don't know a whole lot about it. Um, uh, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, but I, I personally don't know a lot about it. Um, and I, but yeah, very, thank you so much. Um, were the Mayan people there before the Nephites? Uh, yes, I think they were. I think there were a lot of people here. Um, like I said, uh, just right in the area where Lehi landed, estimate maybe about a thousand villagers and you know, in people living in small hamlets, things like that. Um, who tended the animals? Uh, probably those people. <laughs> How about the idea that uh, the prophecy of 600 years uh, were angel years being one year <laughs> from Passover to, or from Passover to Passover, 600 Passovers would end exactly to the day as prophesied. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm not familiar with that idea at all. Um, uh, I'd have to do some more research before looking into it. Like I said, though, there are other ways that people have tried to solve that chronological problem. Uh, I tend to think that just reading them in their own historical setting and context is, is the best way to do it and not try to come up with other ideas. Um, other than Sorensen's proposed landing site of Guatemala, what other sites do you find likely? Um, you know, I'm really not... Uh, I haven't, I, I'm not really a, much of a geographer myself. I've read a lot of the different geographies and I've compared and contrasted them a lot. Um, I tend to find most of Cor Sorensen's correlation persuasive um, with, I would make some adjustments, but not a lot. Um, there are others who have done a lot more research than I have who will very passionately disagree and uh, you're welcome to have conversations with them about it if you want to.
if there were pre-existing peoples in the promised land, uh, why do we not see greater conflicts, wars, interactions between the groups outside the Nephites and Lamanites? Uh, this is a very good question. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, what it really boils down to is most of the wars and conflicts throughout the Book of Mormon do in fact involve other peoples, but uh, Nephi and his descendants have uh, used the Nephite Lamanite designation as an in-group, out-group type of label. Uh, so when they're talking about Lamanites, that's the out-group. It doesn't really matter who they are, whether they're directly descended from Laman or not. Um, and there are, are, you know, Brant Gardner and others have, have written about that subject. Um, Okay, so uh, I suppose they're asking me about um, around what period uh, in Nephite history do you see the transition from hunter-gatherer back to agricultural living um, society uh, for the Lamanites, I, I'm assuming is what he means. And that's, we, I don't really know. Um, we know that by the time uh, Zenith uh, moves his people back down to the land of Nephi, you've got Lamanites living in cities. They've got kings. They're taking tribute from other cities, namely the city of Lehi-Nephi, while the, city, the, the culture of Zenith is there. And that's, you know, sometimes second, second century BC. Uh, so it would have happened before then. Um, well, probably well before then. Uh, I'm guessing it really wasn't very long. Um, and the Nephites perpetuated this, uh, this stereotype nonetheless. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing it wasn't very long before they actually started settling and, and uh, getting cities and things like that. Um, and that's all of them.